Okay, well, I, wa I was going to give you the second half of session two of the talk, The Sleep State, uh, today. But I've decided that I'd like to talk with you, I would like to talk with you so about something that I should have talked with you about, um, and I've mentioned quite a number of different times before, and I sh should have talked with you about much earlier, I feel. So this is the subject of our talk today. It's part of the God's Laws series of talks, and it's the law of cause and effect. Sound boring? No. <laughs> okay. Um, the law of cause and effect fundamentally is quite simple. The basic premise of the law of cause and effect is this. That every single thing that ever happened, in other words, every effect, had an underlying cause. So that sounds pretty basic doesn't it, to understand. Now, what most the time we do is we then look at that from a very physical perspective. Does that make sense? So, for example, if we get a sore on our arm develop, we look at that and that's the effect, okay, of a cause. And so what we do is we physically start examining the reason why that sore on our arm developed. And it may work out that we were deficient in a certain vitamin or, mi vitamin or mineral and all of a sudden the sore developed. Right? And so we see there's a, there's, an, if, there's a cause which was the deficiency in the vitamin and mineral and we then take that vitamin or mineral and all of a sudden the sore starts healing up and it goes away. And we go, great, we found the cause of that particular event. Right? So, that, so this applies from a physical level. And there are many events that have causes that are physical in nature. But when the problem that we face is that we have a tendency as humans to only examine the physical level. And this is where we run into the main problem that we have. And that is, while we are physically centric, while our awareness centres around physical matters, we do not understand yet the true effect of the law of cause and effect. Because every single, this law of cause and effect also applies spiritually. It has a spiritual level. Now I'm talking here, if we're talking about our body, we're talking about our physical body, right? So we're talking about our actual physical body. If, if I'm talking about my spiritual, I'm talking about my spiritual body in terms of what happens in my spiritual body. Now let's look at the same thing happening with our spiritual body. Our physical body had a deficiency of a certain type of mineral or vitamin in my previous example that I just gave you. And and so the sore developed on my right forearm. All right. Now, if I have a deficiency of a certain mineral or vitamin, why does the sore develop on my right forearm and not on my left forearm or my left bottom or my right foot or whatever? What, what's going on there? Why is it happening in the left side of a certain location? So we've got to understand that the physical part is not everything that's going on. Because if it was everything that was going on, our whole body would be covered with the same thing and not just a certain location. Right? So there's obviously something else going on. So what a lot of spirits have done once they've passed over is they no longer have a physical body, so what kind of centre do they have of their awareness? Their spiritual body. So they now focus on the awareness 
in their spiritual body. So this becomes their level of awareness. And then they start investigating and they go, wow, yeah, that's why I got the physical sore when I was on earth. Because in this location of my spirit body, I see there's an energy problem. There's an energy deficiency that causes the flow of energy over my, physical, over my spirit body to actually create some kind of a vortex or hole there that then allows any physical manifestation of the deficiency to occur in that location. So they start seeing a, a, a link between the spirit body and what's happening to it, and they become aware of the spirit body, and they start seeing the effect in their spirit body, and then they go, wow, that means the mineral wasn't necessarily the cause of my physical body problem at the time. What was the cause was this energy problem. And, and what they do then is they focus their intellect in particular on fixing the energy problem in that location of their spirit form. Does that make sense? And sure enough, you can do that. You can, if you really concentrate and you really try hard, you can actually do that. You can actually cure certain parts of your spirit body by using that method. And, and so then they go, I've now found the real cause of that problem that I had when I was in my physical body. And that real cause was the energy that was flowing in a certain location of what was going on there. And they still have not found the real cause. Because there's this third element that we've got to factor into everything. And that is our soul. And our soul be is the most powerful of all of God's creations. One thing that you're not yet fully aware of in terms of your own emotional awareness, now many of you are intellectually aware of this, but emotionally yet to be aware of, is that your soul is actually more powerful potentially than the sun. Your soul is able to manage more or higher amounts of energy than the sun can actually emit. You understand? This is your potential. So it's not what we're doing right now, obviously, but it's our potential. Our potential, uh, this potential of the soul. Now, the soul, If we become aware of it, so we need some awareness of the soul to be aware of it. When we become fully aware of the soul, we start understanding its true power and nature. And we start seeing how the law of cause and effect actually is created through what is happening inside the soul. So... In the previous example I gave, physical body had a deficiency of a certain vitamin and mineral in a certain location on my body, and all of a sudden the body developed into a sore. I fed myself the mineral and it cleared up. And then when I passed in the spirit world and I looked at that event, I saw that actually my spirit body, even now I've got rid of my physical body now, my spirit body still has the same problem in the same location. And I'm going, why is that? I can't take a mineral now and fix that particular problem, so I go through this process of discovering about the energy systems of my body and changing it and developing the energy systems of my body, and I'm able to repair my body that way, still using my mind to sort all of these issues out. Not understanding that the true cause is actually something that's even deeper than that. It's actually something that's going on in my soul. Now, if you look at it from a, from a physical perspective, if you imagine your soul like this, encompassing your two bodies, which are basically at this point overlaid each other. Does that make sense? I'll draw one like that, and maybe I'll draw one in purple so you can see there's actually two different bodies there. One's a physical body. One that you can currently see, and one's a spirit body which only spirits could currently see, or you can develop your spiritual body's eyes to see yourself. 
And then you have your soul, something that you can't see and the spirit body can't even see, enveloping or controlling these bodies. So everything that happens to these bodies, any accident, any event, any attraction, any relationship, any physical harm, any health problem, everything that happens, happens because of what is in the soul. Now, the law of cause and effect has many aspects to it that we need to investigate. And one of the aspects that we need to investigate is what, how do we go about addressing the effects of certain things? For example, let's, on the previous comment that I made, I suggested to you that the soul controls every accident that happens to this body. Controls every accident that happens to this body. So you walk along, stub your toe, soul controlled that. You walk along past a bush, there happens to be a little uh, prickle on the side of the bush, you scrape across and you get a little scrape across your skin. Your soul controlled that. You're out playing footy or basketball and the ball drops on your nose. The soul controlled that. Right. Most of us would go, no, no, the other guy threw it at me. No, no, your soul controlled that as well. And then, um, you know, you're driving down the highway and your left front tyre just blew out. Your soul controlled that. That's what I'm suggesting, basically. And, and what we need to do is we need to understand how it controlled that. Because we can deal with the effects. So the front tyre blew out, on the side of the road, we undo the tyre, put in the spare, Ah, oh, the spare's flat. The soul controlled that. Right. And, and so, you know, we ring up the RACQ, if we remember. <laughs> in, the, in Australia, in, in Queensland, that's the Royal Australian, Queen, or whatever it is, Queensland Car... I, I don't know what it stands for. <laughs> I'm a member too, you know, that's pretty bad. And uh, so you ring them up and they come out and sort out the issue for you and your soul control that. And if you weren't a member and you're sitting on the side of the road flumming a ride for something, your soul controlled that. Right? And, and what I'm suggesting to you is that every single effect of every single thing that happens in your life at every single moment, whether you are in the spirit world or on earth, your soul controlled that. Right? So is that quite an interesting idea, isn't it? That soul controls all of these things. Now, how does that re relate to the law of cause and effect? Well, the law of cause and effect also has this side point to it, which is very uh, important to understand, and that is this. That if I attempt to fix the effect... I will automatically be creating another effect. But if I address the cause, all effects related to that cause will automatically change. Does everyone get that? So let me illustrate how that works, shall we? We'll go into how, how that works. By the way, ask questions at any time, so fire away if you've got questions. Yep. Okay. So remember what I just said. I said that the, if we focus on dealing with or solving the effect, we will in fact create another effect. That's what I said. That it often will be of a similar nature or even worse nature. But if we deal with the cause, then all effects associated with that cause automatically are dealt with. They're all solved. They're all resolved. Now, when you get sick, let me give you the illustration. When you get sick, I used to get really sick once a month on the average for a, month, for a week. Um, 
Everyone used to say that I just had a very poor immune system. <laughs> My mother used to get really worried about me when I was young because I had such a poor immune system. I would spend a good week of every month home in bed um, and often a couple of weeks of every month home in bed being sick. And it would be usually a combination of asthma, a virus of some kind and a number of other things all happening at the same time. And so quite often I would be staying home from school dealing with all of these effects. And like quite frequently I would get very, very bad hay fever. Many of you have had bad hay fever, yes? How many of you have ever had bad hay fever? Like where everything's just blocked. It's very uncomfortable, isn't it? It's just like, yeah. So I used to get that all the time when I was a child. And, and so eventually the doctors gave me what you guys would call antihistamines. Yeah. And, uh, and that helped a lot. Like I would take an antihistamine and the effect would disappear for four to eight hours on the average. And since I was a child, um, I couldn't take another one usually for a whole day, which meant for the other 16 hours of the day, I was still, everything was just still running out of me. And, and I had no idea what the cause was. I was a child too and I had no idea about God's laws about cause and effect and my mother and father had no ideas about the law of cause and effect so of course they went for the physical solution but the physical solution just created more effects and in the end I got to the stage where um, these pills I became sort of almost allergic to some of them and so what would happen I'd have to stop taking them and then find another one that I could take and so forth. And eventually I'd run out of how many I could take and then, and then I had to get back to just dealing with the effect again. And it was pretty constant. So that's why most of you still see me carrying around handkerchiefs, which is a very old-fashioned thing many people say to do. And, and yet I, for some reason, still carry around too. <laughs> and... What I find happens now is they do get used, but not by me. <laughs> Usually they get used by someone who's crying that I've caused to cry, but <laughs> so I give them my hanky. Yeah. And so I have a supply of about 100 hankies at home because I didn't really lose them in the process, <laughs> but, but not for the same reason I used to have when I was younger. So what, what, I, what I was doing is, uh, and what my mother and father were doing, were trying to cure the effect by using a medical means. And I never had any, any success with that all of my life. And, and it wasn't until I was 34 years old that I stopped having hay fever. And I can remember the events that caused it. I started crying. Before then, I didn't cry at all. And I started crying when I was 34 years of age. And when I, when I started crying, I noticed all my hay fever stopped. And there was only one time that I got hay fever after then. And that was when I was around a cat. And then I'd get hay fever. But other than that, I could, be, well, I could walk through a field of wheat. Not a problem. Before then, if I walked through a field of wheat, I'd be hospitalised, usually for a couple of days. Uh, with all of the different effects of doing so. And, uh, and on, on, on a number of occasions, I nearly died before I got to hospital, walking through a field of wheat. And then after 34 years of age, I could walk through a field of wheat, I could run through a field of wheat and not be affected at all because I started crying. And that made me realise, yeah, the hay fever is about the crying. It's about the suppression of my grief and I started to put these kind of things together and so um, but there was still this problem where it was the cat you know every time I was around the cat bang it would start again and it was only when I was about 38 years of age that I sorted that out and uh, and what happened there was uh, well no, no probably even 40 I was about 40 actually when I sorted that out and what happened there was I realised the relationship between my father's emotions towards cats and my emotions with my father. And once I realised there was these relationships going on where my father disliked cats and he used to get quite angry with cats. In fact, what my father does, and I'm sure um, 
he'd be fine me mentioning it, actually. But uh, he used to have a 22 rifle. I don't know if he still has, uh, but he used to have a 22 rifle. And he used to watch for the cats outside the yard passing through his yard. And any cat that passed through his yard, he would shoot and bury it in the backyard. Doesn't matter whether it was somebody's pet or anything like that. It would get shot and buried in the backyard. And it took me back to an event uh, when I was a child, actually, this emotion. Um, an event that happened when I was about, uh, would have been about eight years of age, maybe seven, uh, about seven to eight years of age. There was a friend of ours that had 38 cats in their house. Now, you can imagine it was a pretty messy house. And my father offered to sort the problem yeah. out for them. And his solution was to shoot them all, which he did. And I helped him. I helped him by, I dug the hole and buried them all. It was a great big hole, I remember, it was about four feet square, about three or four feet deep, and we just threw all the cats into the hole and buried them. And it took me back to that event and a lot of grief about that event. And once I released the grief and fear about that event, um, no more hay fever with cats. So that was gone. Now what I'm illustrating by that experience is that we can deal with the effect by taking pills, all these kind of things. That's fine. That's up to you to do that. It's, you know, it's your health and your life. You, you do what you want. However, it cannot permanently address the problem. And we need to understand this. That the only thing that can permanently address a problem is dealing with the cause of the problem. The actual cause of the problem, not, not what we imagine or hope the cause to be. Uh, Linda, you would like to ask? So, AJ, my eldest son, who's now, I don't know, 27 or 28, however old he is, mm -hmm. Um, he had asthma when he was small, like really quite sick at times and needed to be hospitalised, mm -hmm. only once or twice, I think. And I, I got to the stage where I was like, no, nope, this isn't happening. My child is not going to be on medication for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. And so I started investigating alternative stuff mm -hmm. and got him into swimming and all, all sorts My of things. My mother did all things. those things, yep. But the thing is that by the time he was about, I don't know, maybe 13 or 14, maybe even younger than that, mm -hmm. he has not, he didn't need anything mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. any, any asthma medication and, and hasn't used anything for well over 10 years, mm -hmm. probably longer. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that how, how does that happen? Did I actually clear some of my grief or did he clear some of his grief or what happened with that? When a child is small, really small, like, you know, just born to a few years old, who's the person has has the most influence over them? Yeah, the parent. The and parent. in this case, it was me, the mother. Mum. So let's say mum. It's always going to be mum probably because in our Western society, that's the general way it happens. Now, as the child goes into, say, six or seven years of age, how much connection now emotionally does he have to his mum? So his mum's still here. It's less, isn't it, than it was when, she was two, when he was two, because when he was two, probably still baby, still needed to be cared for food-wise. By this stage, they're starting to eat their own thing, you know, get their own snack out of the fridge, um, do a bit of stuff with friends. You'd be less around mum. Yeah, And then by the time they were like 13 or 14, what's happening now? Well, they're usually quite independent and making a lot of decisions for themselves. Doing their own thing, doing, having their own life, so forth. Almost every child onset disease has nothing to do with the child. It has everything to do with what the parent is doing emotionally. What's going on in the parent's own soul. 
Now, what causes asthma is a fear of grief that you don't want to feel. Yeah, that's true because I, I know that I've, I've done a bit of processing around it and I realised that his grief was that he had this huge job to fulfil because I needed somebody to love and I didn't want to feel my grief around being alone. And none of that is the truth. No? No. Because you didn't, get, you didn't understand what I was saying to you. And many of you parents are still having this problem of not understanding what I'm saying to you. The child did not get their problem by any grief they had. It's my unhealed, denied grief. It's your fear of your grief. You see, when you have fear, what, this is something we need to understand. Again, it's a cause and effect issue. When we have fear, we do not understand the effect, as parents, we do not understand the effect it has on our children. Many of you think you're making your child safe by being afraid for their welfare. The reality is fear is the worst possible emotion that you could potentially project at any living creature, including your own children. Your own fear is the worst. Now, how do you project it? By not owning it, by not actually feeling it. That's how you project it. So, whenever a parent does not own and feel their own fear, the child is feeling the full barrage of their fear. And in that moment, there is no love. Fear and love cannot coexist at the same time. Does everyone understand that basic principle about love and fear? And I'll say it again. Fear and love cannot coexist at the same time. As soon as you f have fear inside of you as a parent, there is no longer any love coming out of you. And the child no longer feels loved. Immediately. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, this applies to every living creature around you as well. Every living creature around you, from insects and the smallest possible creatures, even viruses, right, and bacteria, right the way through to your own child, all respond to your fear. And as soon as your fear is present and denied, in other words, you're not feeling it, but it's present, Every one of those things responds in a attacking or negative manner to the fear that is present. Does everyone get that? That's the soul creating something. Now, in this case, your soul and the denial of the fear of your grief created his childhood onset asthma. And as he grows... He disconnects from his mother more and more and more and therefore is less connected to mum's emotions. And as a result, automatically has less asthma. Now, for many children who, ha who are, as adults, still have asthma, they have yet to actually disconnect from the mother's emotion. And therefore have yet to disconnect from her fear of her grief. And as a result, are fully uh, asthmatic still, even as an adult. Mm. So, basically, we both still have to deal with our grief separately now as adults. Well, no, his grief is very different to yours. Yes. His grief is that every while you had a fear of your grief, he did not feel loved. So his grief is about not being loved. Your grief is not about that. Your grief is about different things. Do you understand? So they are very different emotions, and one is the, the, the grief in him is a result of your creation, but it's not the same emotion you have. And we, yeah, that makes sense. Does it make sense? Yeah. And this is what we forget as parents, is we're forgetting that it's our emotion denied that is now projected and the child automatically, not only the child, every living organism around us responds to that denied emotion. 
every tree around us, every bush around us, every insect around us, every child around us responds to that emotion. Now, because our child is very connected to us and very personally involved with us, they're going to have the largest response to that emotion generally. So because he's the eldest, he was the one that was most affected by my denied grief because none of the others had asthma. Yes, because usually a mother has the most fear of anything when she's the first time mum. Is, is that not true? Yeah. How many of you were freaked out first time mums? And then second time? A bit easier? <laughs> The only thing that freaks you out then generally is the birth <laughs> and, then, and then so forth, isn't it? it? Generally it gets easier, you get more relaxed, both parents get more relaxed, they're both more into a routine, they understand the process so there's less fear in the, in the, in the relationship with the child. In the, first, the first child generally feels the fear the most and as a result is more hooked into the parents' emotions than, than other subsequent children. Unless subsequent children have other emotions that are, that are being hooked in. For, in. for example, sometimes the first child is not the most approved of child because they felt the most fear, right? And therefore they had the largest fear response. And you find in many households, in fact, that the first child has the most physical ailments as well for the same reason. And then subsequent children often have less. But that is not a rule. It's just a general thing that happens for many families because many families have dealt with some of their fear by the time the second child comes along. And then by the time the third child comes along, there's less fear and more projection of investment. So unfortunately, the young... The younger child actually get more investment emotionally. And when I say investment, they, the parents want things from them uh, a lot more generally. And so then a lot of times the younger children have the opposite almost feelings that they've got to work their way through. They have feelings of demand, feeling that they can expect things. Feel, and all, So it, it's a general cycle that many families go through. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. If we go to Elaine, then across to Natalie down here. With a child that's been labelled autistic, mm -hmm. is it generally one major emotion or because there's, I believe, sensitive, born sensitive, is it several? They're getting a whole barrage. They're or? getting a whole barrage. An autistic child is very sensitive emotionally and they do not have any sense of themselves emotionally. So the only thing they can feel as a result of them not having any sense of themselves, which of course is related to their parents' condition as well, is the people in their environment. And what they do then is they respond immediately and without any checking to every single person in their environment. And this is why many parents of autistic child, children notice that when the parent's a bit more afraid or a bit more stressed out, the child acts worse or differently and, and they can see the relationship not understanding the cause. The cause is the soul of the parent, not the soul of the child. Natalie? Um, just recently I spent some time in the shopping centre as you Yep. Yep. And Jade was with me yep. and she decided she was going to get under the table and play and yep. she was very quiet and I was with a customer at the time and I just looked around and I couldn't see her and I just, you know, five minutes went by and I was like, where did she go? You know, because normally she would say, oh, I'm just going to the toilet, I'm just going to do this. Yep. And so the adrenaline starts pumping. Yep. I'm feeling quite sick in my stomach. My question is, am I living in my fear in that place? Yes. Or, okay. Obviously. Okay. Yep. You're feeling some fear, but you're living in it. The underlying cause, the underlying cause is not being experienced, which is you're afraid of her life. You're afraid of her potentially being harmed. You're afraid of some child molester grabbing her and taking her away. That's the real fear, okay. not, the, not that fear that you're actually living in, which is the fear, where is she, where is she, where is she? That's covering a lot of other, a lot deeper issues. Okay, yep. thanks. Yep. If we just pass the mic back one row. So if that, what she was explaining um, about the child, so the, the fact that the child was missing was caused by the soul fear, mm -hmm. but the feeling that she was having of going, oh my God, oh my God, 
that's living in the fear? That's living so, in the fear, okay. not addressing the real cause. So, and as a result of that, she's in denial of the real cause, which means the real causal fear is being fully expressed and therefore fully felt by all of her environment. Okay, so what would be dealing with the fear? Would she, like how, because like I'm feeling fear now in mm -hmm. speaking. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, so dealing with a fear is a bit, bit different because dealing with a fear is you, you won't go into a panic and try to do something. You see, what we do when we're in a lot of emotion, I mean, we're talking here about emotional fear. Obviously, physical fear responses are a little different in the sense that you're afraid of something like you pull away from it. There's a physical protection of your body there. I'm not talking about those kind of things. I'm talking about the emotional fear that's present inside of us that we feel in a, in a situation like this. So in the situation like that Natalie just expressed, the emotional fear is that something is going to happen to my child. Something bad has happened to my child. And I'm, I'm really freaked out about what it is. Something must have happened. And, of course, uh, when you think about it from a suggestive perspective, the chances of something bad happening are quite low, actually. But, but it becomes our highest fear, right? Which indicates that there's an emotion from some past event inside of ourselves that we need to uh, connect with. So, it's, so if we act and try to find the child... Right? without dealing with the fear, without actually feeling the fear, the reality is there's a high likelihood we won't find the child. <laughs> there's also a high likelihood that we're going to push the child even further away because fear does that. Fear rejects. Fear pushes things away. But on, on top of that, we're not understanding that the fear that we're trying to act upon is actually caused by a deeper emotion, the real cause of this event. The real cause of the event of my child doing this going off without telling me has been my soul <laughs> and its emotion, right? whatever it's feeling. And, and so what we need to come to terms with is that actually if I act in this moment and if I act in accordance to my panic, then all I'm doing is denying the cause and trying to solve the effect. Right? Which means, as I said earlier, I'm going to create another event of a similar type down the track that may even be worse in its nature than this particular event that is attracted to me in this particular moment so that I can access the actual cause that created this particular event. Okay, Does everyone understand that? Yeah. Yeah. A little bit more on that. Um, so if, as I'm feeling this fear come up right now, yep. What is the best thing for me to do? Well, just what you're now doing. See, that, that's the right thing to do. So, so you let just straight away into the grief of the fear, and that's the thing to do. Just feel it like that. That's that is a beautiful thing to do. And as you do that, now you're feeling it instead of denying it. Does that make sense? That's all you need so, to do. So the anxiety part of it is living in it, but this feeling that I'm having now come up is, is actually dealing with the cause? Exactly. It's getting you closer to the actual causal emotion. And you see, what we're doing is we hold ourselves, with fear what we do is we hold ourselves in a stoic place. You, you understand what I mean? You hold yourself in a place where you don't feel the underlying emotion that needs to come out before you'll access the cause of this fear that you experience. So... If you get up in front, uh, or you, 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 you know, got a mic in your hand, and you begin to speak, and you can feel that there's fear there, and then you shove it all back down without going into those tear, the fear tears, I'd call them, without going into that, then what's happening is that you are shutting down the underlying cause of the fear that you're experiencing. Now, intellectually, you think, oh, no, I'm just trying to ride the wave of it and get over it because I want to ask this question. But the reality is you've just shut down your soul to ask the question. Whereas now, your soul is open asking the question. Very different. Does that make sense? Um, if we come down to Barbara, and there was nobody. Yeah. 
I'm, uh, I'm uh, fearful about the answer you're going to give me on this one, AJ. <laughs> <laughs> um, my son Mitchell has never been sick in his life, mm -hmm. um, but when he goes away and he comes home, he always comes home sick with a cold or within the few days of arriving home. Mm -hmm. So I always put it down to, well, what did you eat while you were away, darling? You know, you didn't look after yourself, you know, <laughs> like mum looks after you. So what's that about? What do you think it might be about, Barbara? Uh, well, I've got this deep-seated fear that you're going to say... Go with not, your fear. I didn't want him to come back. And he felt that. No, that's not what I'm going to say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know why you'd thank me. If it was the truth, I would say it. <laughs> um, whoops. What do you think it might be? Uh, well, um, you've said to me before that um, emotionally he feels responsible for my emotions. So is it connected with that? Yes, it is very connected <laughs> with that. <laughs> yes, very connected with that. Um, many of you don't realise that when I give you a general one-line comment, there's usually a lot in it, yeah. right? And a one-line one line comment I gave to Barb some time ago, probably a few years ago now, was that she's very emotionally invested in her son. Now, he feels that emotional investment as oppression. When he comes home... There's the difference between when he was away not feeling oppressed and when he comes home, he now back into oppression. And in that particular moment, there's automatic stress in his body, which automatically attracts a virus or a cold or something like that. Does that make sense? Because he, when he's with you, he does not notice that he's being oppressed so much as when he's not with you and comes back. Does everyone understand why that's the case? So it's like, if, if you're living in a situation that you tolerate or have to tolerate, you get used to it, don't you? Have you, have you found that with your sense of smell? You can be right next to a sewerage plant, and after, I think it's, there, there's a period of time, I'm not sure how long it is, but I think it's about, uh, it's, it's about an hour or a bit less or something like that. I'm not sure how long the time is, but there's a time where you actually become detuned from that smell, and you actually sit there living in it quite happily. Right? Because you don't even notice the smell anymore. And it's very like, much like that with your life. We, we're often sitting in deep levels of fear and other emotions in our life, not realising what's getting projected at us because it's normal. We've become desensitised. It's the old adage that if you put a... Um, what, what, what is it normally used, a frog or a, a frog into boiling water? Of course, it, he'll jump out straight away. You put him in cold water and you heat it up slowly, he will stay and boil to death. And we're exactly the same. We're exactly the same as that. You put us in an environment for long enough and slowly, you know, change the environment. We tolerate it. We tolerate and tolerate it and tolerate it and tolerate it until, you know, until the point that something happens where we feel it's unbearable. We will continue to tolerate it, unfortunately. But when you go away from it for a week or two weeks or whatever and then come back to it, you find it initially intolerable. And as a result of that, that is the time when your body goes into stress, your, your soul is in stress, causes your spirit body to st get upset in terms of its energy system flow, and your physical body usually manifests some kind of illness or sickness as a result. So, he's telling you... I knew I wasn't going to like your you answer. Knew, yeah, you knew you wasn't going to like the answer, but it wasn't the one you were expecting. But... He's telling you that he still feels this terrible feeling of emotional investment that you have in him. And if you look at your law of attraction with men, you can see why you've had the emotional investment in your son. You've wanted to create a perfect male that you can interrelate with and get a lot of your needs as a female met from a male, your son. You don't get every need met, but you get a lot of them met. And then you don't need another man in your life as a result. And... And this is the projection that he feels every time he comes home, every single time. And, and so it's an indication that that's not healed inside of you. 
he will actually enjoy coming home and you will actually enjoy him either leaving or coming home. Either way, it won't bother you uh, once you work through that emotion. Yeah. Can you see again the relationship between the cause and effect? Like you can, start, you can start looking at what it is from a physical perspective and say, and you do, don't you? You say, okay, what have you picked up? What bug, who are you with? What have they got? Maybe we need to... How many girls did you kiss? Yeah, yeah, how many girls did you kiss? Who were they? <laughs> you probably got it from one of them. And um, you, you also then make up concoctions. You know, here you go, here's your you know, vitamin C drink or whatever it is that you want to make up to cure the problem that actually has a completely different cause. And as a result, will it happen every single time or most times he goes away and comes back home? The interesting thing with that, AJ, mm -hmm. is that um, he often rings and says, can I come home Of earlier? course, of course. Because, you see, he is totally emotionally invested and you are totally emotionally invested in his emotion. So here he is, here you are, right? He can feel you and he's emotionally, and he feels your emotional investment in him. And when you have a feeling, oh, I'd like to have him home. Oh, I'd like to have the man around. I'd like to have all those feelings that you have. He is automatically feeling. And of course, he's going to ring you up, say, I'd like to come home. And you go, oh, at last he's coming home. I'm so relieved. That's exactly what happened just this week. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. So, so again, he's just showing to you. And see, this is where we go as a parent. But he wanted to do it. Yeah, of course he wanted to do it. He's emotionally invested in you for the whole of his life. Of course he wants to do what you want him to do. That's what he wants. He thinks that what he, is what he wants. He doesn't have the freedom to make any other choice. And that's the cause. So he, him even phoning you and saying he wants to come home is because of whose soul? Your soul. Yep. yep. And of course his response to that, that he's learned now in his soul over the period of his, what, 18 years or whatever it is. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Good. Great. And then up the back. Yeah. Um, what about uh, effects on groups of people? You know, like it could be a number of people in a car crash or in a collective household, the dog craps in the lounge room or something like that, you yep. know. Yep. Good. Um, are the causes, like everybody's, like firstly, is that everybody's cause and effect? Or is it, you could say, oh, this is your law of attraction and not mine. Or, uh, um, and are the causes, if, if it is everybody's, then are the causes related? Everybody affected is involved in the cause. And is the cause so a nation goes to war, everybody affected was a part of creating the cause of that war. And is the cause, uh, is it a common cause between people or can it be completely different causes with the same effect? Uh, it's usually common causes, yeah, of course. but. Uh, but, but often the underlying emotion is quite different. So, you know, you and I can have a very similar, similar uh, event happen to us, but as, a re but as a result of a different emotion that creates that event happening. So, for example, we might be in an accident. You injured your left side of your body in the accident. I injured my right side of my body in, my accident, in the accident because the car came from a certain direction or in the middle or whatever it is, you know. So, so, so w we could say that we were both in the accident, but the fact that I injured one part of my body and you injured the other part of your body demonstrates that there was a different cause inside of both of us to that particular accident. Does that make sense? What happened to me physically and emotionally and spiritually is the underlying, is the effect of the underlying cause for me. Yep. So, for example, if a person is raped, the rapist and the, the person who's been raped have two completely different causes going on for that particular event. Does that make sense? They don't, they don't have the same cause. The woman who was raped didn't want to be raped. Right? So she had a completely different cause going on as to why she was raped than the rapist who did want to rape her. 
had going on inside of him. But they are both a part of the creation of the event. We're not talking about whose responsibility for the unloving action. So the rapist has the potential of not choosing to rape. So therefore has a far larger culpability for the unloving action from a compensatory perspective. But the cause is the souls of the people involved. Everybody affected is involved in the cause. Everybody affected. So if something had, like the roof fell in today on all of us, we would all be a part of the cause of that event. Does that make sense? Yeah. And by the way, the council would also be a part of the cause of the event because it affects them. Financially it affects them, so they would also be a part of the cause of the event. Does that make sense? Everybody affected is involved in the cause. So, like, if in that situation, might all of our emotions be completely different that, that have caused us to be involved in that? Yes, they will be different because it will affect us in different ways. And how it affects us determines what the cause is. But, but obviously, we are affected by being involved, so there is some effect created by our cause. So, so for example, something happens on the other side of the world, and you turn on the telly right at the moment, and that's the first thing you see you are involved in the cause of that event. <laughs> Does that make sense? Because it just affected you. It just affected you. So you are involved in the cause. There's something inside of you that added to the event to actually cause it. Can I just... <laughs> that needs to settle with you. Because you, start, you see, you start understanding. This is where it's very important to understand this law. Because if you start understanding how everything in your life is actually a part, that is a part of your life, is involved because of the cause that happened in your own soul, that there's something in your own soul creating it, you start to actually, for the first time in your life, have the power to change things. You see, the majority of us are addicted to changing effects. And the problem with being addicted to changing effects is that we are reducing the power of our own soul. Because our own soul is the most powerful when we address the cause rather than the effect. And most of us are purposefully reducing the power of our own soul by continuing to attempt to address the effects. And if we had instead focused on the cause, we would be increasing the power of our own soul. And quite often exponentially so, because once you address the cause, now a whole series of potential future events or effects that could have happened now no longer will happen. So you not only solve this particular event, but you now solve or have the solution to every single event that is caused by the same thing. Can you see like, the power of that? And this power occurs positively and negatively. So we've been talking a lot about the negative effects of different causes, but there is positive effects of different causes too. For example, if you exercise a passionate desire in harmony with love, the law of cause and effect will demonstrate to you that actually you will always get the things that you desire. Because it's a natural consequence of the law of cause and effect. You see? And this is why I've been emphasising to many of you, follow your desires, find your desires, embrace them, really follow them. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be shying away from them. Don't be trying to um, ask other people what they are or any of those kind of things. You need to embrace that because there's a positive side to every single law. You, know, you have to remember that all of God's laws are loving. Every one of them. So that means the law of cause and effect is loving. 
And everything can be embraced in a loving manner and have a positive outcome as a result. Because it's loving. So the law of cause and effect, when understood and actually embraced in a loving manner, what it will do is it will have everybody affected is involved in the cause that was positive, not negative. Do you follow that? Yeah. So all of these laws are f f like one of... One of the biggest things in my life in 2,000 years has been investigating laws of God. If you ask the Apostle John what he's passionate about, he's passionate about different things than I am. And, uh, and my passion has always been this focusing on how God's laws work. Because God's laws are like a framework that everything else exists within do you know what I mean by that? It's like a framework. You, you imagine, um, the, perhaps, how can I illustrate this? Because it, this is a universal un uh, thing to understand. That all of God's laws are what enable all other potentials and possibilities. So all of God's laws can exist without the possibilities. Um, the entire universe came into existence and is structured in its current form by laws that were created before the universe came into existence. The law existed before the physical thing came to be. Every single law that governs your soul came into existence before you, your soul, or anybody's soul for that matter, was created. Every single law was present. Now that's pretty fascinating. That these laws exist without the physical matter or the spiritual matter existing. And if you can understand that every one of God's laws is loving and was in existence before anything physically or spiritually in terms of matter was ever created, then you begin understanding the, the power of actually engaging those laws at your soul level. You see, see what most of us are doing, excuse me, I'll just... What most of us are doing is... We are avoiding God's laws or trying to work around them constantly. And in the process of doing that, we are actually working against laws. Now let me illustrate to you how that looks. So if this is a brick wall, you imagine that's a brick wall, this is how it looks. <laughs> that's how it looks. Huh? That's what we're doing in our life. Now what do you end up with? Minimum, a headache. <laughs> Maximum, your whole skull cracked apart. Death, in other words, is what you end up with doing that. And the majority of us are continuing to see God's laws as trauma and, and something to rebel against and something to avoid and something to work around. You cannot work around any of God's laws. Now on earth we get used to working around men's laws, don't we? Do you find that? Yeah. Speed limit, 100, totally open road, no one is on the highway, 130, 150, 170, yeah this is comfortable because we are so used to wanting to get our own way, wanting to break the law. Now, from God's perspective, we often just constantly butting our heads against the brick wall of God's laws because God's laws are unchangeable. You cannot adjust them in any way and they affect all of us in the same manner. I am totally under the same control of the same laws and the same manner as you are. There is no difference. There is, all of God's laws are completely loving and completely Perfect, but also completely just and completely in harmony with equality. 
All of them. We all live by them. So then we've got to ask ourselves, why does a different thing happen to me than happens to you? Because of our soul. What's going on in our soul? Natalie. AJ, you just said before that um, all of these laws were created before any physical or spiritual matter. Mm -hmm. Can, do you know, have you discovered why? Like, I, I, I don't understand the purpose of having laws. I understand how the laws affect, like from what you're saying, I understand how the law is affecting us spiritually and physically. All I can do is this, uh, talk to you about what I've discovered. Okay. And, and what I've discovered in, the, in this process is that God has this, and, and I'm still fascinated in the process of law because how, I'm still fascinated in how law provides framework. Like, uh, like, um, it's a very fascinating thing from a physical and spiritual perspective how all of the smallest particles in the universe, the adamantine particles in the universe, how they all respond to every single law that God's created. They respond completely to every single law. And I'm fascinated, it's a fascinating subject. But if you think of it, if you think of it this way, God has actually created a whole series of structure that I am still in the process of discovering, and I'm talking about 2,000 years so far of discovery, receiving divine love in the process of discovering, and I'm still in the process of discovering two, these, these min, this minute infrastructure that is, that is universal in nature, but affects every single particle within that universe, and how God placed that structure in place before the universe came into existence. Now, we do know for certain that God did that. And the reason why we know that for certain is that the instant the universe came into existence, it instantly conformed to those laws. So that proves the laws had to exist before the universe came into existence. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and so we can continue, and this is why I'm fascinated in law. And at this stage, the highest law I've ever discovered is the laws of divine love, the, the laws of repentance, forgiveness, those kind of laws. They all involve the laws of divine love. Which I've, you Remember in a previous talk, I gave a talk about the hierarchy of law. And I said the uh, laws of divine love are higher than the laws of natural love. And then we talked about the laws governing the soul being of a higher nature than the laws governing the spirit body. And then of a, of a lower nature again, the laws governing the, the physical body. Now, if you discover these things about law and how they all relate, you can find out some fascinating things without ever having to investigate using any other method. It's sort of like discovering the law of gravity without having to drop a ball and see what happens. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the law of gravity, for example, is a framework that God has placed on the physical universe for a lot of good physical reasons. This law of gravity is in place. And, and yet the only way presently that we came to discover it was by actually doing experimentation. But what I'm saying to you is that it's possible to discover laws that are yet to have an effect. Right? Something that might happen in the future. It's potentially possible, theoretically. Now, that's a, a fascinating process in itself, right? And, I, and I'm getting off the subject of this particular law. What I want to under, everyone to understand is that this law is loving in its nature, always. And so when I drive along in my car and I have an accident, the law was loving. So why did I have the accident? Because I was doing this. <laughs> to one of the laws. I was beating my head against a brick wall with something and the eventual result of that is personal pain of some kind. Does everyone understand that, Natalie? So then, basically, the law of cause and effect is in place so that we always have an opportunity to deal with the cause? Yes, that is God's purpose. God's purpose with the law of cause and effect was to say to you, and it's a, it's a very clever law in a way, if you think about it. He's saying to you, if something happens to you, then something inside of your soul created it. 
That's what he's saying. Now, if that thing that happened to you was good, then something inside of your soul that was good probably created it. And if the thing that happened was bad, then there's something inside your soul that you consider, you know, that, that is against one of the laws of love created it. Because all of the laws are loving, so therefore the only time that we can have an unloving effect from a loving law is by actually having an unloving cause inside of us. Does that makes logical sense, doesn't it? Yeah. If all the laws are loving and the effect feels unloving, then that tells me that the actual cause must have been unloving. Is that not a logical conclusion? And that is the case. And what God has done is created this law... And if we understand it, and, and, and I'm just giving up the terminology, that's all. I'm not, you know, from God's perspective, you know, God doesn't call it the law of cause and effect. It's just a law that we've discovered that actually has a, has a cause in the soul that creates all of these effects. Good and what we would call bad or evil or negative. Mm, same. Thanks. Yep. If we yeah, go, just go to, yeah, and then come across the law lane, you've had your hand up quite a number of times, then up to Nora up the back. So is this the same as the law of attraction? In what way? Is it the same law? No. Can you no. elaborate on that then? Well, the law of attraction is a little different, isn't it? Is in that it says, the law of attraction says that, um, that everything inside of my soul creates every event. Right? And any event that's attracted to me has, has the underlying reason is because my soul attracted it. And the way in which it attracts, the, the law of attraction governs. So in other words, if myself and, and um, Graham are in the same car accident, we're sitting next to each other in the same car and we have the same car accident and I get injured in a different way to Graham, right? then the law of attraction has caused my injuries to be different to Graham. And the law of attraction is based upon some of the things that are in my soul. How it happens is in my soul. The law of cause and effect is a little different in the sense that I can address the causes or I can deal with the effects of that law of attraction. So the law of attraction attracts the event, but the cause of the event with something else inside of my soul. Yeah, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, just. Yeah. Yeah. So the law of attraction is the thing that creates the event. And the, the, in terms of there is a law that, that correlates causes and effects. And that's called the law of attraction. The law of cause and effect. So and perhaps I can illustrate this more fully. The linkage between cause and effect is the law of attraction. Does that make sense? Yeah. The linkage between the two yeah. is the law of attraction. Yeah. The, the law of attraction yes. creates the link. Yeah. But the actual event is created by a certain cause. cause. Yeah. yeah, I think I get that. So they're, they're different laws. Yeah. Yeah. They are related, heavily related, because they have an effect on them. both of us. Both of them have an effect on their life. The law of attraction is the messenger of the truth, if you like, to us. And, but we can either ignore its cause and deal with the effects, or we can start addressing the cause. That's the power. The power we have is to either ignore the cause or address the cause. Yeah. And the law of attraction doesn't determine that. That's our choice. That's our decision. And so the law of cause and effect I really love a lot because it actually, the other factor of it is our free will. We have the free will that God has given to us to ignore the cause and deal with the effect. Or we can choose to go differently and address the cause, which is always in our soul. Yep. Yep. And we were our next. Lorleen was next. Um, yeah, I've got to remember what the question is. Oh, sorry. oh God's laws are loving. Everything is loving. Um, if we are born, we have our soul, and then we have... Our parents causing our error or whatever. I'm having trouble seeing that as loving, even though I know our parents cause it. Do you know what I mean? Like the soul is, uh, 
has no defence against that. No, your soul has very little defence against anybody else in the universe acting in an unloving manner, whether that's your parents or anyone else. Because there is no law looking at unloving events. There are only laws looking at loving events. Do you understand? Like, our soul has no defence against unloving actions. In the sense that we can't prevent unloving actions taken by others. We can't prevent them, ever. Now, when you're in a state of complete love, you don't need to prevent them anyway. Because they don't affect you emotionally anymore. You don't feel bad about them. So to you, they're not bad anymore. So when you're at one with God, somebody comes along and shoots you, you don't think that's a bad event. So you're not afraid of somebody coming along and shooting you anymore. And because you're not afraid, the chances of it happening are far less. <laughs> Does that make sense? Right? But if I'm not at one with God, and someone comes along and threatens to shoot me, I'm afraid of death. And so the chances of it happening are greater. And also, I am going to be traumatised by the event because I'm not yet at one with God. I'm not yet in a state of complete love. So there is some fear in me that needs to be released. And it's going to be released through the event that I've attracted. You're still not convinced, Lorleen. Uh, I, I guess I'm feeling that um, that's connected with uh, the law of free will then, isn't it? Is that how it is? That well, this is, this is something that we need to understand about the law of free will. We all have been given free will in the sense that we ha all have the right to make autonomous decisions by ourselves. But there are responsibilities in every single law. And one of the responsibilities of the law of free will is that if I make a free will choice to harm your free will, now I am out of harmony with the law of free will. So if I make a choice to take actions that harm your free will, I am now out of harmony with the law of free will, which means I'm beating the head against the brick wall of the law of free will now. And there's going to be some negative consequences, both to you and myself. We are not independent. The only time you'd be totally independent is if you were the first person that was alive in a certain location and the only person there. And even then you're not independent because every single living creature around you is affected by whatever you feel. So you're still not independent. Free will and independence are two totally different things. You see, most of us, what, what we're trying to do, most of us, if we're, is we're trying to be independent. The reality is that that is impossible in the universe that we live in, to be independent. We are all dependent. The reality is, if the, if, if the world was destroyed tomorrow, six billion children of God would pass from this world world to the spirit world. Isn't that the reality? We are dependent upon the earth for our physical survival. There's an automatic dependency. We keep forgetting this. We keep, we keep forgetting we're interconnected. This is how we're interconnected. So yes, I have free will, but if I use my free will in disharmony with the laws of love, I am going to harm you every single time. I'm going to harm animals, birds, other living creatures, trees, the earth itself. I'm going to harm my own environment every single time because I'm acting out of harmony with the law. I'm butting my head against the law. And every time I do that, I will have pain. So a lot of times when we ask these questions, Lorleen, it's because we are not prepared to feel our own pain. All right? Because we have this belief system that I shouldn't have to feel the pain that others have created. Does everyone get that? How many of you feel it's unjust to have to feel the pain that others have created? Yep. 
that's one primary reason why none of you are at one with God yet. Because to become at one with God, all of us on the planet are going to have to feel the pain that others created. And you know what that's called? That's called forgiveness. That's what it's called. When you're prepared to feel the pain that everyone else has created inside of you, you will have forgiven everyone. And that's the higher law related to the law of divine love. Does that make sense? That's one of the higher laws. Now, if we do not involve the law of forgiveness, then we're going to have to go through what's the other thing called? The law of compensation, a lower law. And it's going to take longer time to sort out the issue. And the only reason why we don't want to forgive is only one reason, and that is because we don't want to come face to face with this primary truth. Everything that happened to me Everything that happened to me, that was unjust. Where do you think I'm going to go with this? Everything that happened to me, that was unjust. Natalie, you want to see if you can finish it off? I created? No, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Rita. I have to feel and No, no, don't just... Uh. I have to feel and forgive. You do, yes, yeah. but that wasn't what I was going to say. It's very simple what I was going to say. Uh, if we go to Nina, just down here, and then maybe Dennis. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. If we, we have to follow this chain of thought. So was created because we didn't have a desire to be in harmony with God's laws or, or didn't no you know you were just born you were just conceived well, and straight away things happened to you that were unjust well somebody didn't want to be in harmony with God it didn't want to be God reliant yeah, but it wasn't you no so but how, isn't how, that the cause, though, that somewhere along the line somebody didn't want to comply? It might be the cause, but I'm not talking about the cause here. I'm just talking about a principle that we need to understand. Because once we understand this principle, you will start crying. Trust me. Ange? Is ours to forgive? It is ours to forgive, but that wasn't oh, what I was going to say. It's much more simple than that. If we go to Dennis, Dennis said he's in My soul created? No. I wasn't going to say that either. We could go on all day. <laughs> Everything that happened to you that was unjust was unjust you see once we really let that hit home we will start to grieve all of the injustice in our life and that's what we need to do you see what we've been doing is holding on to the injustice in our life and when we hold on to the injustice in our life we don't grieve it and therefore we cannot forgive is if we understand this basic principle that everything that's happened to me in my life that has felt painful in my life was unjust. And so I probably should qualify that everything that's painful in my life that's happened to me in my life that was unjust is actually unjust. And once we allow ourselves to actually realise that, we will be able to grieve all of those events. See, this is, this is the issue that I'm going through at the moment a lot. Just this issue of allowing myself to feel the injustice of how I get treated at times, the, the total injustice. Right? And, under, and allow myself to grieve that it's happening. Just allow yourself to grieve it. 
in the first century, one of the f things I learned uh, early in my development spiritually, and it's taken me a bit longer this time to learn it, <laughs> is that forgiveness is one of the primary things that you can develop to actually work your way through things emotionally and get closer to God. Forgiveness. But it's not what everyone on earth thinks forgiveness is. It's not what they think. Forgiveness is this coming to the realisation that every pain inside of me that was unjustly caused did have an unjust cause. And that all I need to do is grieve it. That it happened to me. I just, that's all I have to do. As soon as I fear it, or as soon as I want to feel that it's unjust and actually feel you know, that, then I'm angry and I'll never feel it. I'll never feel it. Many of you are not going to ever feel things while you stay in the state you're in with regard to the statement of justice. You want justice. And I've said many, many times that justice is not love. It's not love. See, the, the, the reality is that many of you if you looked from a point of justice, many of you would be fully justified becoming pedophiles. Now, shall I qualify that? Many of you have been sexually abused as children, have you not? If justice was the criteria in which you wanted to live your life, then surely that would then justify you becoming a pedophile of children. Because that's what happened to you. It's the same principle like a murderer. If, if somebody murders somebody in your family, like your child, surely justice would dictate that you just murder their child. Then you're even. Doesn't it? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, life for a life. Isn't that the concept that we have of justice? That's the concept we have of justice. It's totally unloving. Totally unloving. And while I do not face that everything that happened to me that, that I, I feel pained about that was unjust, was actually unjust... I am not going to work my way through the grief of it. You see, what needs to happen on the planet is every single person on this planet needs to release the feelings of injustice that they have. Because if we don't release the feelings of injustice, we will continue to demand justice rather than love. And in demanding justice, we will do and perpetrate some very unloving actions. Whole wars have been caused by the feeling of injustice. Yeah. Whole war wars, world wars, in fact, have been caused by this feeling. So we need to deal with that. But that's a little bit of an aside. Can you see the causal emotion of why we feel things are unjust? Uh, that actually things happened to us that were unjust. <laughs> and we need to be prepared to just cry about it rather than doing anything else about it. But most of us want to scream and yell and shout and we want to be totally angry and annoyed and we want to take affirmative action for all of the injustice that has been done to us. And while we do all of that, we are going to create more Injustice. What we don't heal within ourselves, within our soul, we continue to create around us. It's the only result. Yeah. Pierre? Me, instead of feeling that it's un unjust, I would tend to feel that I'm responsible for what happened and I would feel like there is something in my soul that created and 
It's hard to feel it's unjust. Let me mm. just briefly mention this feeling of responsible. I'm responsible. So, you are not responsible for absolutely everything that's happened in your life. It's impossible for you to be responsible for everything. I'm not saying that you don't have a cause in your soul. I'm saying it's impossible for you to be actually responsible for everything. And the reason why I say this is, is this. That the moment of your very conception, at the moment of your very conception, a whole heap of damaging emotions entered your soul. And that was totally unavoidable by any act you could have taken at the time. Totally unavoidable. No, so how can you then say that you're responsible for the, those emotions that entered your soul? What's actually happened on this planet is we often have parents who tell the little child that they are responsible for what the parent is not taking responsibility for and that's the emotion that prevents a lot or that's the feeling that prevents a lot of emotion from flowing right. see see I need to come to terms with the fact that actually when you treat me in an unloving manner there is a cause in my soul if I get hurt or if I feel pain from the event there is a cause in my soul but I am not responsible for you treating me in an unloving manner because you could choose to treat me differently. And you are responsible for that, not me. Does that make sense? So you are, I am not responsible for every unloving thing that happens to me. There may even be a cause in my own soul that attracts the event, but I'm still not responsible for it because it's the person who chooses to act in an unloving manner who is responsible. And, and the point of that is that at the moment of conception, your parents chose to un act in an unloving manner in the sense that they chose to not release all of their emotional injuries before you were conceived. And if in the future we had some parents who chose to, to release all of their emotional injuries before they conceived a child, the child would not have any of the damage that those parents had and now do not have. And so therefore, the child must not be completely responsible for what actually happened. Right? However, there is cause and effect involved. So there is a soul-based thing going on in the soul of the child. The personality of the child is the perfect child to actually help the parent work their way through their emotions to get to a state where they no longer have them. They're the perfect personality for that parent to actually work through their emotional condition. But they're not responsible for how the parent treated them. This parent is. And God's laws all address the causes back to every single factor. Every single factor is accounted for in all of God's laws. In fact, there's a statement you'll find in the pageant messages that say the wheels of God's laws grind with exceedingly tight tolerances. And what they imply is that you can't get away with anything. It will always be attributed to the actual cause. See, the law of cause and effect is also affects us in this way, and that is, whatever happens around me, remember, and if I'm involved, there is a cause within me. And if I choose to deny the cause and choose to act in an unloving manner, then the effect is going to... Uh, that of, of what I create is also going to be attributed to me. So for example, let, let me give an example. A parent, a parent, maybe a mother or something like that, when she was a child, was abused sexually. She has a baby daughter. The parent does not deal with the emotion. She does not address 
the emotion inside of herself of the abuse. In other words, the fear that she has and the sadness and grief that she has and the terrible effect it's had on her psychology and so forth. She chooses to deny all of such things. As a result of the denial of all of such things, the child is totally exposed to potential perpetrators abusing her. Now, this is actually a loving thing. If you as a parent do not love your child enough to actually deal with your baggage, then what other possible reason could you ever have for dealing with your baggage? Do you understand what I mean? If, if, if the love of your child isn't a large enough reason for you to deal with your baggage, what is ever going to be a large enough reason? I, I suggest nothing is going to be larger than that reason. And see, th this is the thing we need to also consider, is that, is that the mother, the child may be abused, but the actual unloving damage that's been done to the child it was not only the perpetrator that caused it, it's also the mother. And it will be attributed to her. Her unloving behaviour of choosing to not release the damage will be attributed to her because of the damage that's now been done to the child as a result of her choice. Do you understand? The law of cause and effect will actually mean that mum will actually have law of compensation issues to deal with the fact that she did not address what had happened to her and therefore caused her child to have the same experience. She was a part cause of her child having the same experience. Not the total cause, because obviously the perpetrator was a large part of the cause, was he not? So he has the primary responsibility, but mum also is attributed the responsibility. There are many women in the spirit world who have yet to exit the hills for one reason only. And you know what it is? That they refuse to accept the responsibility of their own child being abused and their denial of their own abuse. That's the only reason why they're there. They refuse to accept that because they didn't release what they could have chosen to release, that, that this event occurred. They refuse to accept their part of the responsibility. And this is one thing we need to understand, is the law of cause and effect is real justice. It is real justice. Right. And everything is attributed. In the long run, everything is attributed. Now, the problem here on earth is that we are so separate from it. We are so separated from the law that we think, and the majority of us continually, butt our head against all of the laws. And as a result, we all have a lot of painful consequences happening all the time. And we start feeling that all of the laws are unjust. They only feel unjust when we act out of harmony with love. See, if we were in harmony with love, we would not feel that any of the laws are unjust. Because we'd understand the purpose of every single law and the relationship between the cause and its effect. Right. I think I'm starting to lose you a little bit with this law of cause and effect. So what we will do is we'll have a break until one o'clock. It's time for a break anyway. And I'll revisit some of these things that we've just been talking about. Does that sound all right? No worries.